Please open your Bibles to the New Testament, and we'll look at, uh, okay, I told you the wrong two verses, Titus 2, 11 and 12. Titus 2, 11 and 12. Now, while you're turning to the book of Titus, let's keep in mind that while we normally say, well, here's a letter written by the Holy Spirit through Paul about a young preacher's work. Well, it is that. But if you will look in the beginning of the book, you will see that once he gets through his salutation, you'll see the very reason he really left Titus in Crete, because that's where Titus is when this letter is written. Paul is not only concerned about Titus, really he's concerned about the church in Crete. Now, I don't have time this morning go back into the way the Christians live. But uh, you might, if you have in mind how the Corinthians lived, just add a, a lot more to that regarding the Christians. It's the way they lived. And you'll see that he's concerned about the church because verse 5 says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldst set in order the things that are wanting, and ordained elders in every city as I have appointed. I'd like to take time, and we may do that some other time, just to go through a survey really to understand what's the purpose of this book of Titus. And while we as preachers of the gospel and as uh, concerning the qualifications of elders coupled with Titus chapter, or rather 1 Timothy chapter 3, look at this. We need to keep in mind... This was a letter written to really a person about that church. And in doing so, he addresses all churches of Christ everywhere. Must keep that in mind about every letter written. Book Romans, written to the church at Rome, but it wasn't written as if it will end all things by the church at Rome 2,000 years ago reading it and everybody else can forget it. Those letters were meant to be circulated because they knew they were writing the will of Jesus Christ. And what was good for one was good for the other. Remember, most letters of the New Testament were written to Christians or churches. Now that we've said that and to see that he is to set in order. Remember Paul's <laughs> statement to the church in Corinth, last verse of 1 Corinthians 14, that all things are to be done decently and in order. And that that can't be done except that we follow and abide by what Christ has authorized in his word. And that's why people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So when we come to Titus 2, 11 and 12, we see that Paul is saying, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, instructing us to the intent that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Now look at the last three words. And that tells us where we're going to be doing all these things. Whatever he means in those verses beforehand, it's in this present age that men are on probation before God. Will we love him? Will we serve him through faithful obedience to his will? Or will we not? As Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. All our lives, that question is at us. Choose you this day whom you will serve. You've got one life to live in the flesh that will determine your eternal abode. And how many millions, millions and millions of people today never, never give that a thought. And many who say, yes, God exists, the Bible's the Word of God, and Christ is the Son of God. But they never really spend time in the study of their Bible. They never learn to examine all things in the light of what the Bible teaches. They don't really know how to handle or write the Word of Truth. They don't know how the Bible authorizes, neither do they know how to ascertain that authority. They can tell you about every recipe under the sun. 
And I promise you on this Super Bowl Sunday, they can tell you all the stats on both teams and everything there is about it. And I'm sure when they stand before the judgment bar of Christ, that'll come up. And they'll certainly be required of them on that. So you see, we all need to be studying uh, football. Now, I make a lot of that to make my point. We get too interested in the here and now. This is where we're always going to be. And we judge everything on the basis of emotions, likes, and dislikes. But notice now, in this present world is where whatever he wrote is to be considered, known, and applied. Now, I go back to the beginning of the verse. For the grace of God. Now, I stop for a moment. The grace of God. We'll talk a little more about that in just a moment, but grace means favor. It means you can't, when it comes to the forgiveness of your sins, you cannot earn it. You cannot do anything to merit it. God makes the way possible when we really deserve damnation. Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. We left God by sinning. He didn't leave us. We must be reconciled to God, not God reconciled to us. We are the offender. He is the offended. We are the ones who are at fault by our own choice, not God. For God so loved the world, even in all of its deliberate purpose to choose to live ungodly, that he gave his only begotten son. Now keep that in mind when it talks about the grace of God. Notice, hath appeared. Now did you notice hath appeared or has appeared? That's past tense. Paul's writing part of the New Testament as he's inspired of the Holy Spirit. We've already said why he's writing it. Before he wrote this, then he's saying, this favor of God appeared some time ago. And notice, it's the favor of God that brings salvation. It brings forgiveness of sins. Now it's true that all men in one sense enjoy God's grace from the standpoint of such as Matthew 5 and verse 5 that He causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust also. So there are those things in this time of probation in the flesh on earth where God blesses atheists and pagans and Christians alike. Atheists get the benefit of medicine. You know, the rankest atheist can have done what Buddy had done. So there's that kind of favor that God has that fits this time in the flesh on earth that is a time of choose you this day whom you will serve. But that's not what he's talking about here, and he makes it clear. He's talking about spiritual favor, salvation from sins, forgiven of sins, reconciliation to God, justified in God's sight. For the grace of God hath appeared, bringing salvation to all men. But here's a a great thing about that. The grace of God that brings the salvation came teaching, instructing us. Now you hear a lot of people, they say we're saved by grace only. They have no idea about what the Bible teaches about grace. They only see God's part in our salvation. They have it completely wrong when it comes to man's response to God's grace that we don't deserve and cannot merit. They will teach you there's nothing you can do in order to be saved from your sins. If you attempt it, you will try to merit salvation and earn it. That is nothing but a reaction to the old meritorious salvation of Roman Catholicism, which formed, laid the basis for the Protestant Reformation beginning around the 1500s in Europe. They rebelled so hard against that that they went the other direction, salvation by faith only. Salvation by grace. Nothing you can do. Nothing but Calvinism in that. Which is wrong. This grace of God that Paul speaks of to Titus, that these people in the church there and everywhere must know instructs us. 
instructions. Remember, Jesus said, all power or authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. That means the Father, the first person of the Godhead, gave him that authority. He has all authority. Where is that authority from he who is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him? John 14, 6. Where is that authority found? Why, well, it's in his word. It's in his last will and testament. I'll just simply say, if you can read and really study and think about the book of Hebrews and miss that he's saying the authority for salvation is in the words of the New Testament, uh, I don't know what to say about that <laughs> because that's the whole purpose of the book is say uh, you Jews who left Judaism don't go back under it because Christ is a far better sacrifice and the New Testament system is far ahead and far better than the Old Testament system. So the authority of Christ is found in the words of the New Testament, the perfect law of liberty, James 1 verse 25. So we used to say when we had debates with folks who had enough conviction and courage to have debates and would defend salvation by grace only that the grace of God came teaching. Well, that's information you need to know if it came teaching because it pertains to man who is taught. And that's the reason Jesus said, go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Preach what? The gospel. Why the gospel is the power of God to save you from sin. Romans 1.16. So why study the New Testament? To learn the will of God. And in learning the will of God, learn my duty to God. And that this life is to be lived, discharging that duty to God. Grace of God came teaching. Thus so much is said in both Old and New Testament about the studying of the Scriptures, knowing the Bible understanding it. If you continue in my words, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Don't study it, you're not going to know it. When you have John 17, 17, Father, sanctify them through thy truth, Jesus prayed. What? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That's the truth that sets us free. You don't know the word, you don't know the will of God. You don't know the will of God, you can't do the will of God. You will not be set free from sin. The grace of God, the favor of God, Jesus Christ himself came teaching. And what did he teach? Well, it was to the intent of something. There was an intent in his teaching. He intended to get us to understand, to enlighten us. And he says, denying ungodliness. Well, I'm a free moral agent. Most people don't deny themselves much of anything. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust. That's what you deny. That's the negative part of it. Stop that. That's what that's been said. Then do this. We should live soberly and righteously and godly. Now I'm back to where I started. In this present world. So now back to this. The Grace of God being the unmerited, undeserved favor of God. And the greatest manifestation of this favor would be in Christ coming to earth and becoming a man. Remember when you read the first part of John, you learn that the Word was in the beginning with God and was God. Then in verse 14, and the Word was made flesh, and we beheld His glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father. What does it say then? Full of what? Now we're right back to our lesson. Grace and truth. You can't have the grace of God that brings salvation without the truth of God that sets you free. John 8, 3, uh, 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 8, 31, 32. All right. The, so the greatest manifestation of this favor would be then in the life and in the death and so on of Jesus, for he died for our sins. I, I read, I drop this in as a parenthetical expression because I pointed out Jesus died for our sins. Now, I pointed out a lot in my sermons, and so has anybody else that knows his New Testament. Not just me, it's in the New Testament before I ever discovered America. Long time. But I hear people trying to talk about to be against Christmas. There's no or 
denomination of the Bible that says we should celebrate Christ's birthday. That's right. There's none. People always do what they're told not to do or they have no authority for. That seems to be the joy of people all around. And then what they're told to do, they don't. But since some of my brethren, well-meaning, I know, why we celebrate the birth and the resurrection of Jesus every Sunday, and then they'll have a picture of the Lord's table. That's just as bad, just as an error as the folks who say it's right to celebrate the birthday of Christ. Can't they read? Can't they know the grace of God came teaching? There's not a thing in the emblems of the Lord's Supper that represents the resurrection of Christ. You're never told to partake of it, showing forth His resurrection. You're never told that. You're never told to partake of it remembering His birth. Certainly all involved in it. But all the authority from the Lord Himself is, you show forth His death till He come again. And the people who made that little thing, meaning well, watched that up as much as anything. Now you say, well, I don't like that preacher. All right, bring me the New Testament of Christ. Notice whose New Testament it is. And from his last will and testament where he manifests his will about anything and about the Lord's Supper, you show me where it says that it shows forth anything but his death till he come again. We're to have our mind on the terrible, agonizing, shameful death of Christ. That's what he underwent so that we might have life. The other's necessary. But it's not in that act of worship on the first day of the week, the worship of the saints, when it comes to the Lord's Supper specifically. And we ought to be careful about those things. So we need to know that when you study the totality of the New Testament rightly divided, then we understand how the favor of God teaches us. God favored us in Christ's coming. There would be a New Testament if Christ hadn't come. Wouldn't be anything like that. And the Old Testament made no sense if Christ didn't come. The writer of Hebrews, as we studied, made it clear that those folks that lived under the Old Testament and all those things recorded in the Old Testament about them as to their great faithfulness was incomplete without us. Because it all pointed to us. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But when that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. For we're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So, grace teaches us what we have renounced. What we've, have you renounced anything at the cause of Christ? And if you did, why did you do it? Is it because the Bible taught you to do it? Are you willing to sacrifice everything, if need be? Notice I say if need be, to be obedient to the will of God. A lot of people are. They claim they are. All my life I've watched it happen. People will make great boasts and in many ways be very faithful until somebody in their family or very close friend violates the will of heaven and then all bets are off. They're going to defend that sinner at all costs. Now somebody else may have done the same thing outside their family or their close friendship or another congregation and that's all right. We'll jump all over it. But not if it's in our family. Too much emotion overriding the authority of the one we say we love supremely, Jesus Christ. And yet Jesus still says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll squeeze the daylights out of your grandchild. You'll just kiss them all over the head and stuff gum in their mouth so they can get it all over everything else. No, there's only one way you demonstrate proper, complete love to Jesus Christ, keeping His commandments. I don't care how good a feeling you got. I don't think Christ had too good a feeling in His fleshly being when He was nailed to that cross. You know, we never think about that. What was He pouring out His heart about in the garden? Oh, I just can't wait to get nailed to the cross. Even the Son of God who loved us and gave Himself for us and knew the end of His life when He came here and why He came and knew it in eternity before He ever became a human being saying on this earth, to this end was I born. And when Peter said, Oh, 
uh, Lord, it'd be far from thee when he was trying to tell them he must go up to Jerusalem and there be condemned and die. Said, oh, put it far from you. And Jesus said, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things of God, but the things of men. See, it's going to be such a pleasant paradise for me on that cross. Well, of course not. Many things we do when we love God hurt. You don't believe it? Just try to read about Stephen and think that those rocks didn't hurt. Think those nails didn't hurt. Paul says that he had been beaten with rods. Been whipped. Forty stripes save one. Now think about that. Tied up. And somebody back there trying to hit you as hard as he can with a bull's whip letting you have it right across the back. And then ask yourself the question, did Paul love the Lord? We have a funny way, even in the church. The church apostatizes too often. The members of the church leave the truth. It's because we think it's a hunky-dory, syrupy little way. The word denying, and under a little technical study here, notice denying ungodliness. The word denying in the Greek language, and you say, well, I don't know Greek. I have to take your word for it. Well, I suggest that the person who knows Greek, as well as anybody can know it today, or Hebrew in the case of the Old Testament, has to take what the grammarians and lexicons say for it. So, I'm glad somebody knew it well enough to give us an English version, but I will say this, that when you have an accurate English translation, you know what's said in the Hebrew and the Greek. If not, why study your English Bible? The word denying is present tense in the Greek. It's linear in action. In Greek, present tense is linear. You draw a line. It never stops. It just keeps on going. Our present tense is in the present right now, but not in Greek. So you've got to learn that. And if you're translating, then you've got to put that. Some things, though, can't be represented exactly in English as it is in Greek. So we look back and we see that that is uh, present tense. But now what's interesting, here's where it gets real ticklish, and I have to have help on this myself. It's linear in action, but it's an aorist participle. Hmm. Actually, it's having denied, literal translation. Having denied or having renounced. You did it one time and what you did here goes on and doesn't stop. Now, I want to show you the practicality of this. There are members of the church, that's all I can really call them because that's all I can see with my eyes because they were baptized, who don't really understand what this is saying. They don't understand it in English. They certainly don't understand it in Greek. What that's saying is, when you fully from the heart obeyed that form of doctrine, before you confess your faith in Christ, the Son of God, you repented of your sins. You, in your mind, died to any known sin. You separated yourself. You stopped it or you decided to start doing what's right. And you resolved in your heart at the point of repentance because of what repentance is, then from then on out, whenever you saw something contrary to the Word of God in your life, you would change it. You see, that's a one-time action. What's it going to do for the future? That's going to be your course of action from then on. And here's where it gets very practical. There are some people that get up on Sunday morning, maybe do it on Saturday night, and they've got to determine, do I really want to go to church today? Do I really want to assemble the saints? If they understood this, they would know that he's saying that when you were baptized into Christ scripturally, from that point forward, you never thought whether you would have to or would or wouldn't do what's right. When you understood it, you just did it. Just as natural to you, I put natural in quotes, because you're a Christian. That's being converted in the full sense of the word. So when he talks about this having denied or having renounced, you did this when you became a Christian, if you really became one. And that's what's being said right here. 
for the grace of God that uh, bring us salvation. It's appeared to all men. And it came instructing us in the words of Jesus Christ in his last will and testament. There's an intent to that. Why do we need it? What did he intend for us to do with the Bible? That denying ungodliness. Having denied it one time, we deny it all the time. From here on out, no questions asked. So, it's a once for all thing. That's the idea. That's why I come in aorist participle, because that's a once for all. When you describe it, learning Greek, you talk about aorist tense, it's punctiliar. It's got a period at the end of it. One time, poop, there it is, done. But this is a poop that goes on. <laughs> and that's why you're baptized that one time, buried in Christ's baptism, and in his death, the blood of Christ is applied, and it continues to be applied. Apply the rest of your life as you walk in the light as he is in the light. You have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin and the Greek tense is there means keeps on cleansing. All dependent upon your faithful adherence to the truth which you resolved once and for all having denied these things when you were baptized because you were converted. So we never intend to practice such things again as long as we live. And we don't have to make up our minds whether we'll do right or not do right every day. We're going to do right as we understand the right. And we're going to study that we're going to understand better how. We're going to pray so that we'll have deeper understanding. So we have denied ungodliness. Once for all action that follows us all the days of our life. So any impiety, any irreverence, any disrespect for God, that's all been put away. That's a general attitude in a person who is disobedient to God, and that's all been changed. Conversion. We're talking about an attitude that makes us unlike God. Now we've changed to an attitude, a state of mind, a frame of mind that makes us like God. Speak, Lord, thy servant here, the commandment I will obey. Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. So when people refuse to follow the example of Jesus, that's who's being held up for us. Remember, he was God in the flesh, just like you are and I am, then they're ungodly. Next of all, we have renounced, we're obedient to the gospel, died and buried as a dead man, raised to walk in the of life, Romans 6, 3 and 4. We renounced by our will worldly lust. Now, our English word lust is used almost all the time to mean not just a desire, but an evil desire. A desire satisfied by breaking God's will. But the word Paul used here can simply mean your desire. We often do it this way. The sexual desire is not wrong. God just tells us where it's to be satisfied. Most people don't pay attention to it. Satisfied any way they want to. That's when it becomes an evil desire, when you seek to satisfy a desire that is satisfied contrary to the Lord's will. So he uses the word, the translator is trying to convey that to our English-speaking minds, worldly lust. And he does that to indicate that the desires we've renounced are evil. Oftentimes, people, if they're serving God like the Bible says they ought to, that is, they're faithful in seeking to bring every thought into, into subjection to Christ. You ever have a thought cross your mind and you say, I don't want to work. I thought of that. That's wrong. That's not right. What we ought to do is say, I sure am glad I recognize it as wrong and I can kick it out. <laughs> Because what well, he didn't know any better and you just thought it his normal course of life. Then you'd be thinking on evil thoughts all the time. The Christian knows the word of God well enough and is seeking to bring every thought and subjection to Christ that whenever a thought crosses one's mind that is contrary to the divine standard, you kick it out. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. That doesn't mean you think about heaven all the time. It means you think about things above being the spiritual things set out in the word of God and doing the work of God in the kingdom on this earth. And boy, if we could just get people interested 
the people that will, are, are nothing but fanatics and idolatrous worshipers of football that will gather around today, if we could get that kind of interest in God and the Bible and spiritual things, there would be a revolution like nobody could begin to understand. So these worldly lusts are the spring, if you want to call it that, the spring of evil water out of which flow all filthy and foolish manners of life, every kind of evil deed and all sorts of things that are right, left undone. So the Proverbs writer said it this way in Proverbs 4, 23. Guard thy heart with all diligence. Why? For out of it are the issues of life. The renunciation of ungodliness and worldly lust is what Paul in Romans chapter 6 calls dying to sin. He just served the idea of the habitual purpose life of sin. When you die to these things, then you die to, you separate yourself from that kind of life because you don't think that way anymore. You don't view the world and life that way anymore. You don't view yourself that way anymore. You don't view your wife. You don't view your children. You don't view the government. You don't view those things like the person without knowledge of God, knowing why they're here, and that they reconcile to God, and then seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. There He tells us in Romans 6 that when we were baptized into Christ, we were baptized into His death. We died to sin. The dead man is buried we're dead to sin. This means that our relationship to, ten, to sin was terminated when we contacted the blood of Christ in the waters of baptism for we were baptized into his death and therein he shed his blood. And since we died to sin, we're not to allow or let sin reign in our mortal body to obey its lusts. I have to allow that to happen. I have to permit it to happen. And I can cultivate an attitude that wars against that, or I can cultivate an attitude that builds toward that. We're not to keep on presenting our members unto sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But we are, and I go back to what we said, having denied, we are once for all to present our members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And that's what Paul's saying in Romans 6. 11 through 13. That's why he begins the chapters. We have it. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? In Colossians 3, verses 9 and 10, the same apostle inspired by the same Holy Spirit had this to say, Ye have put off. This is a church at Colossae. Ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Notice it's renewed how? It's renewed in knowledge. Does that remind you what Paul had to say in the book of Romans in chapter 12? He said here in the first verse, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, notice what he does, by the renewing of your mind. Why? That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Considering that grace is a favor, then through the word of God, the word of his grace, the grace of God came teaching, we learn to be sober. Now, I'm not talking about somebody that's giving up drinking whiskey or something like that, although that would entail that. I'm talking about even when you never touched a drop, learning to think like you ought to think. This word soberly comes from a Greek word that suggests the exercise of, of that restraint that governs all passions and desires, enabling the believer 
to conform to the mind of Christ. Now, that's what find his expository dictionary in New Testament words says. Paul wrote in Philippians 2, 5, have this mind in you. That's something I must do. I can do it. He didn't tell me to do something I can't do. And he says, which was also in Christ. So in this word, grace teaches us that we are to continue to deny ourselves of godliness and worldly lust. We're to love the things Jesus loved and hate the things that he hated. We're to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, 1 John 2, 15. And by the way, he's discussing the same thing here that uh, Paul is. We're to love God with our whole heart and mind and strength and then love our fellow man as we love ourselves. We're to love the brethren. We're to love God. And when we do, we will obey him, 1 John 5, 3. We'll love our neighbor. We will do him no ill, but rather we will be ready to help him in any way possible. Romans 13, 10, Luke 10, 30 through 37. Grace teaches us to live righteously. This has reference to our treatment of our fellow man. And the word godly has reference to our treatment of God. Paul tells us, be tenderly affectioned one to another, communicating to the necessities of the saints. Render to no man evil for evil. Be at peace with all men, if possible. Let us not judge one another any more that we may not put a stumbling block in our brother's way and destroy him for whom Christ died, Romans 12, 10 through 18, and chapter 14, 13. In other words, that stumbling block is, if I act this way, even in a matter that's not right or wrong in itself, but it causes somebody who's ignorant of certain matters to go out and sin, as one preacher put it, well, will my actions cause you to go out and rob a bank? That's what the biblical stumbling block is. Then I have to be mindful of those things. Paul to the church at Ephesus wrote, putting away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather uh, labor. Let him labor, working with his hands, a thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. It's a novel idea, isn't it? Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from among you. With all malice, and be kind, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Then he talks about putting put fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, which is idolatry, and all of that. Let not be once named among you, nor filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not fitting. Everything that involves this world, put it away from you. Grace teaches us godliness. I wouldn't know how to be godly if the Bible didn't tell me how to be godly. We should have that attitude toward God. Psalm 111, 9, holy and reverend is his name and everything pertaining to him. We should therefore choose carefully how we refer to God and how we think about God. When people refuse to follow the example of Jesus, who was God in the flesh, when they refuse to practice things which make them unlike Jesus. They can't be godly. They would have to be ungodly. Next, we've renounced worldly lust. And that, we must realize, is how we're going to end the lesson. We have renounced all things that pertain to this world and handicapping us from doing the will of God. And if you're going to become a Christian, now you know what it is that you're going to convert to and what you're going to leave behind. And when you're baptized in the death of Christ, for it to be effective and you're to rise to that water and grave of baptism, your sins forgiven. It's because before you were baptized, you fully repented with a resolve to die to everything, separate from all things contrary to the will of heaven in the rest of your life. Study the Bible to know the way of righteousness. That's what it means to watch it grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. The grace of God came teaching. Will we be taught? You need to obey the gospel. We've studied how to do that today. If there's a child of God, you've sinned. We urge you to repent of it. If it's private, take care of it there. God knows your heart. But if it's brought reproach on the blood-bought body of Christ, repent of your sins. Confess them. Come, confess them, and we'll pray with you and for you as loving brothers and sisters that you may be forgiven. Let us follow the way of the Lord. Come now while we stand and sing.